This session of Nuts and Bolts of New Ventures is entitled Finding Your Customer. Our speaker, Bob Jones, emphasizes that the only thing you need for a successful venture is customers. Put another way, you're unlikely to succeed if you can't find a group of people for whom you have a compelling value proposition. Bob is a serial entrepreneur in the health sector, having launched four companies in the medical nutrition field. He has held executive positions at Abbott Laboratories and Baxter International. He is an active mentor with the MIT Venture Mentoring Service and is a national advisor to the Pipeline Entrepreneur Program in the Midwest. He has an AB in biology from Princeton and an MBA from MIT Sloan School of Management, where he and I were classmates. After our Bob plays in a blues band in the Boston area and is part of a volunteer group that plays and sings at homeless shelters. Bob's talks are always entertaining and informative. I hope you enjoy it. So, I have this old fashioned idea that if I'm gonna ask you for your attention for the next uh, 80 minutes, I should try to give you something in return that justifies that request. And in thinking about this talk, for the last couple of days, I realized I actually have three questions, which are, who are you, what do you want, and what are you working on right now? And I admit that the first two questions sound like something you'd ask somebody who shows up on your doorstep with a handful of pamphlets. <laughs> you know, who are you and what do you want? Um, but Joe did a pretty good job of telling us who you are at the front end, and I looked at the sign-up document and read through a bunch of your comments to get some ideas as to what you want. And here's what some of you said. I want to develop a research venture into a business venture. Well, fact is I did that, so I might have some thoughts about that. Interested in a broad overview navigating funding, healthcare industry, technology industry, hiring for your weaknesses. Oh, that. Well, that's 10 or 15 minutes. Um, kidding. Ooh, I'm planning to start an enterprise in the mental health space. This individual has their first 200 customers here in the room tonight. <laughs> How to pitch my venture, get an idea up and off the ground. Those are separate things. We're going to talk more about the latter in the next couple of days. If you're still around next Tuesday night, we will talk about how to pitch your venture. I'm currently participating in Start MIT and would like to complement this with the Nuts and Bolts course. I'm excited to gain a deeper understanding around issues and challenges in entrepreneurship. I like this. Digging in, wanting to know some of the block and tackle stuff required to actually make a go of this, because it's, as Joe said, it's a context sport. It's not really theoretical. Planning to start my own venture, and I believe this course will be very useful. Well. That expectation's way too high, but we'll do what we can. And this next one is my favorite of the bunch. I was the CEO and co-founder of a startup company, and we didn't do very well. I love this. I wish to understand my mistakes and improve my skills so that we can start back again. How many of you have taken some or all of this course in the past and are back again? Well, welcome, I'm glad. How many of you are or have been involved in a venture which disappointed you? Oh, this is wonderful, thank you. Uh, I work with a lot of outfits and I do from time to time work with these sheltered little snowflakes who've never been allowed to fail anything and they completely implode when their business doesn't do very well tears, weeping, et cetera. And I really do think that a fundamental success criterion for making it in entrepreneurship is some measure of resilience. And then it'd be a little off topic to elaborate on that, but at some point maybe we will anyway. So I have an idea who you are and I have an idea what you want and I've seen two examples right at the beginning of the evening as to what you're working on 
Raise your hand if you're working on a venture of some sort right now. Awesome. Well, I'd love to get one or two of you to tell me what it is, just so don't tell us anything confidential, but do you have a dog walking service for two owner, sorry, for two for dual income families and nobody's there in the middle of the afternoon to walk a little Fifi and that's the, the unmet need? Do you have an artificial intelligence approach to managing chronic diseases? Give me some sense of what you're doing. Somebody raise their hand and, and tell us what you're up to. Ed, tell us again. I'm working on a crop remote sensing venture uh, using airplanes instead of either satellites or drone for smallholder farm holder, uh, smallholder farmers uh, for the purpose of insurance and government planning, etc. Wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and who's your customer? Right now, right now, the customers that we've identified are both the government and uh, insurance companies, particularly in India. India has a third largest crop insurance program going on right now uh, and being administered at great expense, mostly by the government, but uh, insurance companies are in interested in some fraud prevention as well. And they're not really getting the data of the resolution that they, that they need. So there is a lot of interest in getting better data at cheaper cost. Great, great. Joe and I do a fair amount of work with some folks in Kansas, Nebraska, and Missouri, and there's a lot of ag business going on there. And one of the sort of surprising uh, ventures involved putting a sensor on tractors that tracks paths up and down in terms of irrigation and so forth, beams it up to the satellite back down to the farmer, and you'd say, well, who cares about that? And the answer is if you're in the business of selling or buying futures for ag and you want to know what the yield is going to be for a crop that's going to pop up three months from now, and you know when the farmer's fertilizing and when the farmer's watering, suddenly you've got an insight into something which turns into real money. Who knew? All right, somebody else? Okay, well, if you guys are feeling bashful, I promise you that won't last long. So my agenda this evening, I think we've covered the first topic. I'm going to try to provide you with a couple of hot tips on how you might find your customers and grow your business. And I'm going to tell you a couple of stories of product launches that I've been involved with. And then we'll try to extract from the specifics a couple of general principles that maybe you will learn in the course of this. And God knows, I hope I've learned. So uh, a couple words on me. I'm currently running my fourth startup. I did a couple of years as a principal in a boutique strategy consulting firm. I ran a soy foods company that publicly traded in Hong Kong. It was a management turnaround. That's a fancy way of saying the company was a dreadful mess and took a couple years to fix it. Had nothing to do with innovation, everything to do with block and tackle. I fired 75 people, had a low need to be liked for a period of time, and lots of blood on the floor while we fixed it. Uh, prior to that, I founded three startups in this business, had a couple of normal jobs, and spent a little bit of time in school. So, oh, also, I spent a lot of time in the evenings playing music. And in addition to this blues band, I do some charity work with a group of really nice people who sing and play in homeless shelters. Um, and oddly enough, on a Thursday morning very early, I'm flying to Nebraska to play a black tie gig for 600 people in Omaha. And I tell you all of this mostly because working with musicians has had a profound impact on how I manage organizations. And I suppose of relevance to you guys, uh, most of the musicians I know are crazy and most of the entrepreneurs I know, you can see the overlap. Okay. Some years ago, during a recession, a lot of companies went bust. Some did not. The Wall Street Journal did a study as to who succeeded and what was the success strategies, and there were two. One was to be the cost leader and aggressively cut their costs. That's not you. The other was to be an innovator, focus on building the brand. And that meant being able to answer a very fundamental question that many people who are technically astute, ignore, which is how is your end user 
dissatisfied because that's where the opportunity comes in. And it does not have to be technology. If there's 50 kids in town that want a bicycle and there's no bicycle shop, guess what? I'm going to make a bold assertion here. Your business might get by, but it isn't going to prosper until you know what you're really selling. We're going to talk about this in depth in the course of this period of time. And who wants it? Not who needs it. Who wants it? Who's going to jump through the telephone and say, please, take my money? And how do I find them? So some fundamental questions you should ask as you're evaluating your business. These seem really basic. But what's broke that we fix? And who cares? And I don't mean that rhetorically. I mean specifically, who cares? If you're selling pain relief and you don't know anybody that's in pain, right? How many of them are out there? And do they have any money? And I have worked with a number of people who have noble ventures. They might have a program for kids who live in disadvantaged neighborhoods who need the benefit of tutorial assistance. But the kids don't have any money, their parents don't have any money, and the schools don't have any money. So we're pushing a rock up a hill to make this business work, right? I've come up with a number of ideas for entrepreneurs, but guess what? Entrepreneurs don't have any money either. Terrible business plan. How do I find them? How do I let them know? How are they solving the problem now? And what about my solution would they think is better? Not what do I think is better. What would my prospective customer think is better? And who's going to pay me? And will they pay me enough? If I, break, if I break my butt for three years to get this business going, and I'm making $11 an hour when I get done, it's probably not a satisfactory return. Think about this a little bit. If you run some numbers and say, oh my goodness, I need $200,000 in revenue in order to pay my bills, and my customers are worth $100 a piece. Oh dear, how am I going to get 2,000 paying customers? And by the way, to get 2,000 steadily paying customers, I probably have to make sales to 4,000 or 5,000, because some of them are going to go away. So how do I do this? This is going to be the only slide we cover on raising capital. But it's not always obvious that really when you talk to people who have a big sack full of money, remember Joe's wisecrack about the green dot on the high I'm Susie tags, et cetera? It's easy to think of these folks as being sort of Olympian. But they know that if they hand out money to every one of you, most of you will fail. It's statistical, right? And so the, there's this great fear. If I raise my money from Aunt Millie's trust fund and I give it to you and your business blows up, then I can't really very well go back to Aunt Millie and say, give me some more money. So my job is to look at you and try to assess, do you have what it takes to be successful? And there's only one non-negotiable requirement. You have got to have customers. You don't have to be smart, you don't have to have money, and you don't have to be good looking. If you have customers, people will think you're smart and you will make money. And if you make enough money, they will think you're good looking. <laughs> so, do you have any customers? Will you? Do you even know you need them? And how much are they worth? How much does it cost to get them? Will you spend $5 to get a customer who's worth three? Oops. That's not sustainable. How long is it going to take to get them? These are pretty basic, fundamental questions. And in their zeal to start a company, many founders don't think about them. So thinking about what you want as you start your business, there's at least a couple of things you should be assessing. How unique is your idea, and how important is it? And of course, the sweet spot is high on both, right? So here's an example. I think most of us would agree that air is pretty important. Probably scores pretty low on being unique. 
Now, I don't want any of you to burst into tears, but when I go out to Nebraska in a couple of days, most of those folks don't think MIT decals are particularly important. So, can you make a business selling air? I'm seeing people shaking their heads. And there were those oxygen bars for a little while. I'm sorry, say again? There were those oxygen bars for a little while that were popular? There was oxygen stuff for a while that was popular. Yes. OK. Any of you guys ever go scuba diving? You ever been in a situation where you'd pay a lot for air? <laughs> yeah, I did my checkout dive off of uh, Catalina Island in California, and I actually went down about 100 feet and was swimming through the kelp beds. Pretty cool, like being in a redwood forest, except way underwater. And I realized, oh, I'm low on air. <laughs> Oops. So, or here's another example. You ever get those containers from Amazon and they're wrapped in that stuff and you just can't resist popping those bubbles? Right, that bubble wrap stuff? I mean, I don't know anybody who cannot pop those silly things. That company is called Sealed Air Corporation, about $3 billion in annual revenue. So under the right circumstances, yes, you can sell air. And if I said for about 11 cents in materials, you can sell something for 5 or 10 bucks, because parents will slather them all over every vehicle they own, you could have a business there, yes? So the point, and, and I admit this is a bit facetious, is figure out who is going to find your offering to be important and unique. Figure out how to find them, tell them what you got, take their order. But positioning is imperative. OK, what if you can't meet those two requirements? What's going to happen to your business? Here's a hint. You Boston people, what kind of fish is that? Flounder. It's a flounder. That's what's going to happen to your company. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was lame. I apologize. All right, here's a business example. Some years ago, I was running the uh, clinical nutrition division of a company in California, healthcare world. It had been doing 200 million a year for 12 straight years, and an entrepreneur came in and bought the company, took it private and leveraged buyout with Alex Brown, fired most of the senior management team, hired a bunch of energetic new managers and said, here's a little stock for you, and here's a little stock for you, and here's a little stock for you. I want to grow this thing 50% in the next three years and take it public. And then you can buy a boat, and you can buy a boat, and you can buy a boat. Very motivating. I was one of those folks that came in, and I was running the clinical nutrition business, which was extraordinarily profitable. We sold IV solutions to intensive care units and hospitals, and we'd make a liter of solution for about $3 and sell it for 70 So I was responsible for a large percentage of the company's gross profits, but I had a bad habit of going out in the marketplace and lifting the lids off the garbage cans and talking to customers. And I figured out that there was this thing coming, managed care, and the business was going to go away. That was a problem, because we had these very ambitious plans. And I felt motivated to try and find something I could do that would replace this. Because you want to buy a boat, and you want to buy a boat, and you come think of it, I want to buy a boat. So, I looked around and I found an opportunity, and it was a potential repositioning of the corporation. Nobody in the country had done this before. Psst, that should be a red flag. So, a little quick medical background. At the time, there were 400,000 patients in the country whose kidneys had failed and who were on dialysis. And tragically, that market was growing rapidly. But if you're on dialysis, you go to a dialysis center three times a week. They're listed in a government pamphlet. There's 1,300 of them at the time. And if you are one of those patients, I can find you on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. 
So I know where you are. Now, one of the things that your kidneys do is help you eliminate impurities, but also fluids. So all of you people who are excessively hydrated would languish if your kidneys failed. It's not uncommon for these patients to put on eight pounds between Monday and Wednesday of excess fluid. The clinical types say, look, you're fluid restricted. Knock it off. But for other things that you, reasons that your kidneys provide, you become clinically malnourished, and you need a nutrition supplement. And all of the nutrition supplements were liquids, Insure, stuff like that. So I looked at this and said, well, duh. Why don't we make something that's high on the stuff you ought to consume and doesn't have any of the stuff you shouldn't consume, doesn't have any liquids? Let's make a nutrition bar. This was before these things were popular. Brian Maxwell had not invented Power Bar yet, et cetera. So this was kind of a radical idea. But we were an ethical outfit, and we had this question, does it work? Well, it's a food product. You actually don't have to do clinical trials, but we did one anyway. Those of you who are from California, you're familiar with Kaiser Permanente. We did the trial with them. Guess what? It worked. We got the results published in a peer-reviewed journal, which is gold standard science. And bottom line, our little magic bar, our nutrition supplement that didn't have any fluids, noticeably improved patient health. So, we said, well, we know how to do this. We're in the healthcare business. Who do these people see? Now well, they see it. A doctor regarding their dialysis regimen. They see a dietitian regarding what they should be eating. So let's talk to the doctors and the dietitians. We can find the opinion leaders. So we asked them, what do you think of this? Typical reaction was, God, wish I'd thought of it. Well, would you recommend it to your patients? Yep. How many of them? All of them. Really? How many days a week? Seven. Really? How do you feel about three bucks a bar? Sounds great. What do you think about the, how we stand against the competition? You don't have any. Everybody else has got, is liquid and you're not. So we did a little math and said, geez, this is a pretty impressive business. Let's get to it. So we brought in the photographers, and we did the beauty shots of the product, and we brought in the, made the brochures. We brought in the sales force, drafted a commission plan, trained them on how this would work, explained to them how much money they would make, and off we went to market. And it was a complete disaster. Months when we were supposed to do 40,000 in revenue, we did three. So, what did I do wrong? Uh, whoa, wait. I'm going to have to repeat what you say for the, for the video here. So, say that again, please. Who was our customers? We talked to the clinicians. We didn't talk to the customers. You sure you guys didn't come last year? No. <laughs> well, actually, that's exactly the heart of the matter. We surveyed the clinicians, but they don't buy it and they don't eat it. We were accustomed to the pharmaceutical model, OK? Your kid's got an earache. You go see the doc. The doc says amoxicillin in five days, and too bad if your kid doesn't like it. Tell him to shut up and drink it. His earache will go away. So if you're a salesperson, once the doc writes the prescription, not so here. They've got to buy it with their own money, and they've got to eat it. Well, when we finally did talk to the patients, they didn't want it. Now, this product extended their lives. And they didn't want it. They also couldn't afford it. But why on earth would they not want it? Well, who gets kidney failure? 33% of them get there from a lifetime of mismanaging their diabetes. 
and 44% of them get there from a lifetime of mismanaging their high blood pressure. So three-fourths of my target customers had neglected their health for their entire life. Why would they start now? Also, if you've got to be tethered to a dialysis machine for three or four hours at a pop three times a week, you're probably not working. And some well-intended social worker is going to come and say, be of good cheer, we're going to get you on Medicaid. Now you don't have any money. And if you do have some money, you are going to spend it on beer and cigarettes, not on my product. Oh, and there was one other problem. We'd been selling to hospitals. This was going to be sold in retail pharmacies. We didn't know anything about selling in retail pharmacies. And if you ever want to have a good laugh, walk up to a busy pharmacist in a CVS or a Walgreens and say, hello, I have a new product that you've never heard of from a company that you've never done any business with, and it's for people who don't have any money and I would like you to carry the product. <laughs> and how do you spell fat chance? I was baffled by all of this. And one day, a kind of a kindly pharmacist put his arm around my bony shoulders and said, Bob, come over here. I said, you see this foot of shelf space? I have a set of algorithms that will tell me in any given month within a couple of dollars how much revenue this foot of shelf space is going to generate. If I take the product that's on there, Crest toothpaste, and put your product on there, I can't think any reason why I should lose any money. So get out your checkbook and write me a check. This is called slotting fees. It's piracy is what it actually is. But the fees are onerous. When I was doing this with CVS, it was a million dollars a quarter, plus 6% of your top line revenue, plus it was a guaranteed sale, which meant if they bought it and it didn't move, you had to pay them to ship it back to you and refund their money. And you had to send them two units of each SKU stock keeping unit that you had for every one of the stores in their chain for nothing. And if anybody reordered it, then maybe they'd pay you in 90 or 120 days for the reorders. <sighs> but oh dear. So we were on track to show Wall Street we were a good candidate. If we had our IPO, my colleagues and I would all make some money. And guess what? My shortfall put this IPO at risk. And I would have to sit in the senior management meetings. There'd be a dozen of us sitting around a table once a month and report to my colleagues that I was knee deep in mud, that this thing just wasn't going anywhere. And you know, I would say things like, well, it's getting some traction, give us a little bit longer. We didn't realize, you know, we overestimated the speed of pickup, et cetera. But you know what? It went on for an entire year. It ruined a year of my life. It did not make me popular with my coworkers. So what we did about it was we learned about inside sales. We said, well, there's 25% of these people whose kidneys fail because they got scarlet fever or they were in a car accident or something. Let's sell it to them. And we know how to reach them. And by God, maybe Medicaid will reimburse for this. Now, you guys probably know this, but Medicare covers you if you're old. Medicaid covers you if you're broke. Medicare is federal. Medicaid is state by state. What do you think are the chances that Massachusetts and Connecticut have the same regulations for Medicaid? <laughs> so getting it reimbursed in 40 different states was almost as much fun as 40 consecutive root canals. <laughs> it was just awful. And so we felt really bad and sold the business. We sold the business to an outfit that specialized in that segment of the patients that had the money. We had a clinical trial, we were the crown jewel, and we got out for about $1 more than we'd put in. So, just to validate Joe's observation that this really is an entrepreneurship, really is an affliction, 
I went off and launched two more of these things and did rather better. And I got contacted by a group of snotty doctors at Harvard Med School. That's probably redundant, right? Oh, sorry. Uh, did I want to start a company with them? No, absolutely not. There's nobody worse to start a company with than a bunch of snotty doctors. But six months later, they called me back and said, well, you know, we've raised some seed capital, provided we find a CEO. And between the investors and ourselves, we've only found one person who's taken this kind of technology and put it on the shelves in Walgreens. Would you meet our investors? One thing led to another. I moved from California to Boston. Here we are. Went through everything they had. Whoever it was that said, take a research venture and turn it into a business. This was a research venture. We went through all the stuff they had. None of it was able to come to market in less than three years. And I was too impatient to babysit a bunch of doctors for three years. So I said, let's do something else. How about if we pick a field that's big enough that it'll get some attention, but where we can handle it with a small underpaid team? How do you guys feel about diabetes? Oh, we like diabetes. OK, well, a little medical stuff about diabetes. At the time, there were 10 million people. It's a chronic disease. That means it doesn't go away. And as you know, your goal is to manage your blood sugar. So you don't want it to go too high. You don't want it to go too low. If it goes too high, you often take insulin to bring it back down. There were 4 million people who used insulin at the time. Here's the problem. If you screw that up and your blood sugar goes too low, well, it's, it's quite different from if it stays too high. If it stays too high for too long, it causes blindness, kidney failure, and amputation of your extremities. So you jazz enthusiasts, think about Ella Fitzgerald in her final days. Well, so we put in something called tight control. Three meals a day, three small snacks a day, small injections of insulin, restrict the bandwidth of the fluctuation of your blood glucose. But the incidence of low blood sugar tripled. And that's a problem. Because if it goes too low, you can faint. If you're out walking around your neighborhood, people think you're drunk. If you're in a car stuck in a traffic jam on the Mass Pike and you faint, that's not so good. And at night, it's really an issue. Because a lot of times they would say, well, uh, I'm not going to wake myself up three times a night to eat something and inject insulin. I'll have a big injection of insulin and a nighttime snack at the same time. And I'll hope that they'll work out through the night. But they don't. Because the food all turns into <laughs> glucose at the same time. So the spike is higher, but the duration is no longer. Translation at 2 in the morning, the insulin is still working. The food is gone. And in the course of the focus groups that we held, I had a temper tantrum one day and threw the moderator out and went in and the other side of How many of you guys have ever watched a focus group? You know what I'm talking about? Right? You're on the one, other side of the one-way glass. Well, I excused myself. I came in and plopped down at the table and said, all right, enough already. You've been listening to this talk for 30 or 40 minutes. Let's skip all the intellectual stuff. What's your biggest fear? And the answer, that I'll die in my sleep. They said, Bob, I don't sleep in a bed anymore. I sleep in the recliner in my living room because I'm afraid if I fall too deeply asleep, I will lapse into a coma and I will never wake up. So call me manipulative, but I thought, ooh, I can sell against that. So we invented something called night bite. We took three ingredients that turn into glucose consecutively through the night. Those ingredients are sucrose, protein, and uncooked cornstarch. Yes, that's in a birthday cake. But yes, we have a patent on it because we're using it for diabetes. And we gave it a non-medical name and non-medical packaging. Why did we do that? Somebody tell me. It's a consumer product. And what was the second half? You're not selling to hospitals. You're selling to consumers. 
Well, yes, that's actually almost entirely accurate. But I talk to a lot of these patients, and they don't like being thought of as patients. Is that what you were going to say? They don't like being reminded about their condition. They would say, I don't think of myself as a diabetic. I'm a banker. I'm a lawyer. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm not a patient. And if I'm in a meeting that runs too long and I need to consume this, it's nobody's damn business whether or not I have diabetes. And I do not want to think, them to think I am medicating myself. I said, well, <clears throat> so what should it look like? He said, make it look like an energy bar, something that an athlete would consume, and make it taste good enough that if my kid has diabetes and spends the night with his friends, and I'm terrified that he's not going to manage, I can give him a couple of these, and he can share it with his friends. They'll say, what are you eating? He'll say, it's an energy bar. It's pretty good tasting. You want some? Said, well, OK. So this time around, we engaged clinicians, patients, parents. We went to the support group meetings. We did not make the mistake that you correctly identified that I made with Regain. This time around, we talked to the people who were going to pay for it. And we picked an ad agency that was familiar with the field. At the time, the leading sources of information were a couple of diabetes magazines. And I said, let's have a look at their advertising. And the back page, full page ad, hypodermic needle. Of course, my reaction was, excuse me, seriously? But the thrust was, our needle is sharper than her needle and it won't hurt as much, so buy ours. I thought, oh, we can definitely do better than that. So we ran ads with flying pigs and some really lame copy about to sleep perchance to dream and, and you know, one bite and the rest is easy and all of that stuff. And we put a little violator, that's what it's called, a little band that goes diagonally across the top of the ad. For a free sample, call 1-800-NIGHTBITE. So we got 100 calls a day and said, oh, we need more phones. And at 200 calls a day, we said, good God, we better hire some people to answer the phones. We were in Kendall Square, and we knew there were more geniuses per square foot in Kendall Square than most places. So we'd walk out into Kendall Square, and we'd say, you appear to have a pulse. Would you like a job? <laughs> I mean, we were pretty indiscriminate. We just needed people. And we ha did have to reposition a few of them. But at 300 calls a day, we said, oh my god, we better have a database. At 500 calls a day, we had to rent tables and chairs and thought, you know, we might be onto something here. And the end result of all this was we got this product in every major pharmacy chain in the country and paid a zero in slotting fees. Never been done. We are, in fact, a Harvard Business School case study these days. It's kind of obscure, but it was a radical move. So the lesson, of course, was understanding our customer helped us make a better product and build a better business. So how did we do that? How did we find them? We started asking, well, where do they look for advice? What do they read? Is there anybody out there they actually believe? And where do they spend their money? Turns out, all right, let me back up a second. There are a lot of people who have diabetes who don't actually take good care of themselves. We knew that. We said, how do we find the ones who not only take care of themselves, but will spend money to take care of themselves? And the answer was they're paying a certified diabetes educator for advice. Well, how do we find the diabetes educators? Well, they have an association. Surprisingly enough, called the American Association of Diabetes Educators. There's a little tab on the front page of the website, locate an educator. And you type in 02142, and out comes all the diabetes educators and their contact information. So, well, that was easy. That red button that Staples has, right? That was. So we ended up having several thousand credentialed professionals as our sales force for free. So let me elaborate on that a little bit. 
12,000 of these folks were members of the AADE. A lot of times they would have a Saturday morning meeting once a month with their patient population. They'd bring them all in, talk about new developments, remind them to behave themselves, et cetera. I called a few of them up. And I said, what's your biggest professional frustration? Would you care to guess what the answer was? Patients dying? I'm sorry? Patients dying. Patients dying. Well, that's frustrating, uh, <laughs> to say the least. Bad for our business. Uh, but, but it wasn't the most common, everyday frustration that they faced. The patients fail to follow their instructions. That's exactly right. I tell them what to do, and they don't do it. The term for which is patient compliance. I tell them what to do. I tell them, throw that ice cream out of your fridge. I tell them, walk away from that hot fudge Sunday. And they say, right. <laughs> so we said, well, what if we said to the diabetes educators, what if we told you that our snotty doctors at Harvard Med School had invented something that your patients will love and it works and they will come back and thank you for recommending this to them. What would you do then? Oh my God, I'd have your babies. Well, don't do that. <laughs> but would you tell your patients? Oh yeah. So now we had a high quality sales force for free. Well, let me rephrase that. We didn't give them any money. What did we give them? We addressed their biggest professional frustration. Compensating people does not have to be cash. Find out what they care about and give it to them. And in this case, we ended up with three or 4,000 highly credentialed people out there. And by the way, I'm going to tell you a little more about this. They would call the pharmacist. Pharmacists would take the product and never mention slotting fees. And you're going to get tired of this question before I quit tonight. But what gave us that negotiating power? What did we have? Customers. Customers. Thank you. All right. So we drew a little flow chart. We said our inside sales force calls the diabetes educators. Diabetes educators talk to the patients. The patients call us up or come to our website, and we make a little bit of money. But it's not enough. We need to get into the retailers. And we're not, I mean, we're not in a position to pay these kind of slotting fees that we had, so how are we going to do that? So we had a few sessions in the office. Our office at the time did not have rock climbing walls or ping pong tables or air on chairs. And we said, maybe we could get the educators to call the pharmacists. And then the patients could call the pharmacists and ask for our product. The pharmacists would be frustrated that they could not fill that order. And then if we call the retailer, maybe we'd make lots more money. Make sense? So we put it to work. But first, it's important to note that our definition of customer has evolved. You guys see that? Yeah. Who was the first customer that we had? The patients, thank you. And then we realized that in order to meet, uh, pardon me, influence a lot of patients, we needed a different definition of the customer, and it became the diabetes educators, right. And now we have to get to the retailers. New definition of customer. So how do we do that? Well, we got these calls from these customers. We'd send them a sample. Oh, <laughs> qualifying questions. Somehow or other, we ended up on a couple of lists. One of our ads said the stuff tasted a bit like a chocolate brownie. And we got on these lists that said we were giving away free chocolate brownies. So. Not every call we got was from a prospective customer. So we learned to ask a couple of questions as soon as they'd call. Like, tell us what brand of insulin you're using. And if they said, huh? We'd say, sorry, we don't have anything for you. But we'd ask the qualifying questions, right answer. We'd send them a free sample. And we'd follow up. 
Did you get our stuff? Just want to make sure, just because the fact that we shipped it doesn't mean you got it. And what was your reaction? Who can tell us what an open-ended question is? Oh my, you are going to be handicapped if you don't know this. Yes, sir? Well, you say, tell me what you think of our product, rather than, did you like our product? Exactly. Tell me what you think of our product, rather than, did you like our product? A closed-ended question answers yes or no. So, did you like our product? No. Oops. Where is that conversation going to go? It's going to turn into an argument. Well, you should like our product. It's fabulous. If you say, what'd you think? And they say, I hated the taste. OK, what else? Well, it worked great. OK, anything else? Yes, I'd like to order some more. Right? Open-ended questions when you're talking to your customers. So we said, well, for a limited time, we'll pay the shipping. Would you care to order? We'd track it. We'd call them up, say, gee, we sent you a six-pack. Aren't you about out? Would you like to reorder? OK, a sidebar fact. About 3% of the people in the country had diabetes at the time. They were responsible for about 25% of retail pharmacy purchases. Because you might go into a retail pharmacy and buy toothpaste and a greeting card and hit the road. They come in and they buy blood glucose monitors, strips, insulin, et cetera. These are high value customers. And they've all started segmenting their customer base. They all read the 80-20 rule, all that stuff. So we would say to our customers, well, we can't pay the shipping anymore. And that means that it's going to cost you more if you buy from us. And wouldn't it be convenient, since you're buying insulin now anyway, wouldn't it be more convenient for you to just pick it up where you pick up your insulin? They would say, well, yeah. We'd say, well, great. Where is that? And they'd say, Sai's Pharmacy. Well, can I call Sai? Absolutely. Hold on a minute. I've got his phone number right here. And you tell that turkey that Mabel wants this stuff. And I've been buying from him for 20 years. So tell him Mabel wants it. We'd say, well, all right. So we'd gather up about four of those. Now, if you've ever watched how pharmacist answers the phone, it usually looks like this. Pharmacy. You got about 12 seconds. So we'd say hi. Your customers have been buying our product from us, and they'd like to buy it from you, and you don't have it. It's for people with diabetes. <clears throat> Wait, what? Who is this? <laughs> and that's called permission to continue. So what can we do about that? Well, you, I mean, you know, look, we're here at Walgreens. We're part of a chain, and I can't do anything without corporate permission. We say, well, I know that. I suspect, however, there's a price below which you can buy without getting corporate approval. And I'm guessing that's 100 bucks. Well, yeah, actually it is. Well, you'll be pleased to know that our starter kit costs $99.95. <laughs> and if it doesn't sell, you don't need to ship it back to us. Throw it in the trash. We'll refund your money. We'll take your word for it. No risk to you. But I'll take your purchase order now. OK. And then we call Mabel up and say, Mabel, Size Pharmacy's got the stuff. Get in there. We'd wait a couple of days. We'd call Cy and say, Cy, we just want to make sure that stuff arrived. And well, wait a minute. Let me go look. Holy smokes, it's sold already. Really, imagine that. Well, I think we need a larger order, don't you? Nobody ever said anything about slotting fees. And I guess you know why, right? What did we have? OK, now here's the problem with going to a retailer. A pharmacy has somewhere around 8,000 SKUs in there. Who knows what an SKU is? Stock keeping unit, right? So 
Crest toothpaste if you're left-handed is a different SKU from Crest toothpaste if you're right-handed and Crest toothpaste if you have red hair. And I mean, product differentiation is nuts, right? So they don't want 8,000 invoices. What they want is to somebody to show up with a bucket full of stuff, Crest toothpaste, greeting cards, cat food, and send them one invoice. Those people are called wholesalers. And we said, well, if we really want to make this business work, we got to figure out how to get into wholesalers. Because if we do that, oh my goodness, we'll have to buy wheelbarrows to carry the money off to the bank. Well, new definition of our customer. We did the same thing we did before. We said, who are they and what do they care about? Well, I guarantee you that wholesalers do not care about patient well-being. What they care about is having a painless day, lots of throughput, make my life easier. We said, OK, how are we going to do that? There was a trade show in our field that was in New Orleans. We said, let's go. We'll set up a booth. We'll generate some business. We called the 25 retail pharmacies that were closest to that convention center and said, we're going to be here on this date for this conference. We're going to stir up some business, and we're going to send some business your way. It would be embarrassing for you if you did not have our product. Would you like to place an initial order? Yes, yes, yes. OK. Thank you. Then I called their wholesaler that supplied all these places and said, you don't know me, but I've just made a little money for you. Because I'm selling this stuff to the pharmacies for 75 cents a bar. One day I'm going to sell it to you for 67 cents a bar. This go around, I'm selling it to the pharmacy for 75 cents a bar, and I'm sending the difference to you. You don't have to do anything. Just take the money. What I want is for you to put us in your system. So if the pharmacy decides to reorder, I can say, be of good cheer. Your wholesaler has our stuff. It worked. One last story. We got a letter in the mail one day with a stamp on it. Antiquity, right? It was from an outfit, a major retail pharmacy chain in the southeast. And they said, we're putting together our planogram for the coming year. Who knows what a planogram is? Is that the sign of the shelf? It's a layout of the shelf. That's right. If you happen to have the misfortune to go to Bentonville, Arkansas, and spend some time at Walmart, they have a building that's, I mean, it's huge, with all of their mock-ups of the shelves, which products go here, which products go down here, all of that stuff. They lay it out quite scientifically, which is why most of the time most CVSs look the same, et cetera. If you want to be in our planogram for the coming year, you have to come to Clearwater, Florida, for a 15-minute meeting. So I rooted around and found out who was running this meeting and said, what's his deal? And they said, oh, Bob, this guy's got a job you don't want. He's got to sit there and listen to one vendor after another for 15 minutes at a time for a whole week. Well, how's he evaluated? He's evaluated on how much slotting fee he can extort from each of the people who come in. And I was feeling feisty, and I said, well, we're not going to give him any money, but let's go to the meeting anyway. So we went there, and we're sitting in the lobby. There were just two of us. And there are people all around us with end caps and all sorts of fancy paraphernalia and promises, I'll walk your dog, and, I'm just, and we're just sitting there. And when our time came, oh, we had a briefcase, I guess. When our time came, the fellow's name was Jeff. I said, Jeff, this isn't going to be like your other 15 minutes this week because we don't have any money and we're not going to give you a nickel. But I'd like to spend five minutes telling you who we are and five minutes telling you what our product is and five minutes telling you why you want us in your store anyway. And he said, well, <clears throat> it's your 15 minutes, sport. Knock yourself out. So in the first... 10 minutes, we did what you'd expect. Oh, we're all geniuses, and we made this wonderful product. 
the last five minutes, we opened up the briefcase and started pulling that paper. We said, these are the individuals with diabetes that we've done business with in the geographies where you have stores. There's 10,000 of them. I'm tired of shipping to them. I'd like to send them to a retail pharmacy. And they're all asking me, which retail pharmacy can I go to to buy your stuff? How would you like me to answer that question? And he sat there, and he looked at us for about a minute. And if you don't think a minute's a long time, hold your breath. Finally, he said, OK, you're in. And that was that. OK, we grew the business. Things went well. We sold it to a billion-dollar company. Everybody lived happily ever after. So what should I have learned from all of this? Since I'm running a, my fourth startup right now, what lessons can you tell me I should have extracted from all of this? Say that again? Know your customer. Know your customer. OK. I'm sorry? Your customers can change. What does that mean? You mean evolve from one day to the next? Yeah, I couldn't spell pivot at the time. I didn't know what that meant. But um, you can, as your business grows and evolves, your definition of who you need to focus your attention on can grow and evolve. OK, what are they really buying? I hate to tell you this, but products that are for everyone aren't for anyone. If you say everybody will love my stuff, you're wrong. My current company makes a two and a half ounce drink that helps people sleep. Every human being on the planet needs to sleep. Boy, is that an idiotic positioning for a business. All right? So face it, nobody needs what you've got. What they might need is the benefit. For example, I'm wearing glasses right now, but I don't need these glasses. What I need is to see better. So I hired glasses. Some of you hired contact lenses, and I bet some of you know somebody who hired the surgeon to do the LASIK procedure? Everybody wants the same thing, to see better. So if you remember one slide from my talk, it's the one that's going up right now, which is segmenting the market. So what does that actually mean? How do people usually, a homeless person, uh, I saw her at one of the shelters I play in. Uh, <laughs> How do people normally segment their market? By price. Price? Meaning what? How much you, you can buy them for? Close, but not right. How do people normally segment their markets? Demographics. Demographics. Well, what does that mean? Yeah, everybody says, I want women between age 25 and 45 with an average household income of 80 grand a year, because after all, they're the primary shoppers, and they've got to have enough money to buy my stuff. Right? You ever hear of that? I disagree. For you, I think you should segment it according to who wants what you've got. Any of you people ever sustain an athletic injury? Did it hurt? Well, you and me both. Did it hurt? Well, if, if we were selling pain relief, shortly after you sustained that injury, you'd be a primary customer. I dislocated my shoulder doing something stupid off the high board at Boston University's Fit Rec Center, as a matter of fact, and found myself at the bottom of a 14-foot pool with a dislocated shoulder. Not the best day of my life. And it hurt. So I would have been a customer for pain relief. After I convalesced, I remained worried. Could still have been a customer. My fellow divers were vigilant. But many people look at that big number at the bottom and say, well, that's where the mass is. 
that's where the market is. It's dumb to go where anywhere other than where all the customers are. I don't agree. I think the answer there is forget it. It's a graveyard. You're running a startup. You're not running Procter & Gamble. You can't afford to find all those people, and they don't care. And you don't have the budget to persuade them. So as an entrepreneur, I would counsel you to start there at the top. A couple reasons. First of all, you'll get traction more quickly. And second, if you fail there, then you probably don't have a good business proposition. Time to move on. I've come to think of entrepreneurs and their ventures as like jockeys and horses. You guys are the jockeys. The business is the horse. Not every jockey picks a horse that's going to make it to the finish line. So if your horse isn't going to make it, figure it out early. Shoot the damn thing. I'm sorry. If you really like it, put it out to pasture. <laughs> Find another horse. Start there. OK, to change buying habits takes a lot of motivation. Pain, fear, greed, vanity, those will change people's buying habits. But virtue is a tough sell. So what was I selling with Regain? OK, I'll answer the question. About once a quarter, the doc would pat the patient on the back and say, your numbers have gotten better. That's virtue. What was I selling with Nightbite? Security, right? If you're worried you're going to die in your sleep, or more importantly, you're worried that your little seven-year-old daughter is going to die in her sleep, and we alleviated that, we had a hit. OK, I like marketing. I think it's really important. You can take a whole year or two's worth of courses in marketing. You can learn multivariate factor analysis and how to use third order polynomials to describe consumer behavior. And I'm going to boil all that down to two points for you. Right? You can send me a refund for your tuition. Find out what your customers want, give it to them. <laughs> and that seems breathtakingly simple. All that other stuff is, how do you actually get to that? If you do all that stuff and ignore this, you will have missed the point. So pick a market segment or two that you can dominate, and that's where you launch your business. Where you start it may not be where you end up, but start at the top of the pyramid. Get some traction, make a little money, pay your staff, and then work down. I used to have a boss that would walk around my office saying this stuff. He'd say, there's no hocus pocus that takes a place of focus. It was just agonizing. <laughs> you know, I'll make him stop, right? but it's true. So with respect to the two people who were brave enough to come give their pitches at the beginning of this session, there was a notable lack of focus in the pitch, perhaps not in the business. So it's find your customers. Where are they? How are you going to do it? If you do it right, selling will be easy. I have become skeptical of social media for this particular exercise. I think, well, one more story. When I launched the business for the sleep product, I thought I was going to be selling to working moms, overworked, overscheduled, overcaffeinated, fussy shoppers like natural foods, right? Made sense. Sent stuff out to 100,000 of them. Almost every one of them said no. Working moms won't spend any money on themselves. They'll spend a fortune on their children buying them useless crap and $2 on their husband. <laughs> Nothing on themselves. But there was a small group that bought and reordered and reordered. And so I got on the phone, and I called him up. Hi, I'm Bob. I make this stuff you've been buying. I love you. <laughs> Why are you buying my stuff? And in the collection of answers, each of them said, I run marathons. Moms who run. Ah, well, why can't it be moms who do CrossFit, moms who do triathlon? Come to think of, why can't it just be human beings who compete in athletics? 
boom, complete repositioning. Athletes know, train hard, eat right, sleep, right? Got lots of people tell you how to train hard, lots of people tell you how to eat right, nobody tells you how to sleep, there we are. I would have died of old age trying to get from one positioning to the other via social media. So in the early days, call them up and talk to them. All right, I'm gonna skip over a lot of this. What was the incentive for? The educators to call the retailers on your behalf. The educator, what, the question was, what was the incentive for the diabetes educators to talk to their patients on our behalf? The retailers. Oh, to the retailers, ah. Because I would call the educator up and say, when you get done on Saturday telling them about this stuff, they're gonna have a couple questions. What's it taste like? You can answer that with the samples. How much does it cost? Here's the amount. Where can I get it? You must have a pharmacy that you send these patients to. Oh, God, yes, I've got a relationship with all four of them here in Abilene, Texas. Yes, sir? How long did it take me to get the diabetes? Well, we really didn't know what we were doing. The question was, how long did it take for each of those sales cycles? We didn't know what we were doing at the beginning. It took us a little while to connect the dots. But once we did, if we called if we found an educator who had a session coming up in 10 days or two weeks, they never had the content ready at the time. So if we said, if you've got any room for some additional content for your Saturday presentation, would you consider us? Oh yes, absolutely, we'd send them the stuff. We'd say, would you call a pharmacy? And they'd say, nope. I'm gonna call him and tell him to get his butt in here and he can tell people he's got the product. He owes me some favors anyway. And the whole thing took two weeks. We got pretty, there was always people who say, I just finished the last one, call me in a couple of weeks and it would take a month. But it was pretty quick once we got the hang of it. Okay, I think that the acid test for being able to do this is the 30 second cell. You should be able to summarize your story in 30 seconds. And it's harder than you think. But I would like to get a brave volunteer or two up here to try this. What I'd like you to do is tell us about your business idea in 30 seconds. Maybe we'll give you 45. And let's see if, as a group, we can come up with a summary of who your target customer is and what are the benefits to that customer. You guys got it? All right. I make a product which brings dead people back to life, and my customers are, and... I'm being facetious, but follow a little bit of a flow chart. So, who'd like to come up and get the benefit of our collective wisdom? Oh, you've been volunteered. Come on. I nominated. You've been nominated. Okay, here are the rules. We don't owe her love. We do owe her respect. We're going to try to help her make sure she's got a positioning for her business, an understanding of who her customer is, and the benefits of the customer. And... Um, First, she's going to faint, so is there a paramedic in the house? <laughs> Come on down. I can't believe she did this today. Well, make her buy you a beer when you get done tonight. Okay. All right, take it away. All right. So, my name's Angela, and I own a company that is um, producing and making CBD bites. They're really, um, CBD is a non psychoactive part of marijuana, it's great for. Um, Sleep, it's great for reducing anxiety, which I have right now. I should have taken one before I got up here. It's great for pain relief, and it can be given to um, just about anybody that has any problems with anxiety, with sleep, with pain. So, and um, we also make these products in um, three different flavors. It's all organic, it's vegan, and really great tasting. Okay, stay put. Thank you, Angela, right? Nah, you're not done. So, let's give her some feedback. You guys go first. Where are you located? Nah, say that again. Where are you located? Where are you located? So, our product is made in Cambridge, Massachusetts. In Cambridge, Massachusetts. 
Okay, and why do we need to know that? Where can I get these CBD boxes? Oh, uh, we're getting warm. Very good. <laughs> so we um, wholesale to retailers in the greater Boston area. We have an online store, so you can buy them there. And we also do farmers markets in the greater Boston area. All right, thank you. And what other feedback would we like to offer? Yes, ma'am. How do you differ oh, that's, from the that's other? That's a really great, I should have said that. So we actually use a CBD isolate, and quite often people use the full spectrum um, cannabis or CBD product, and the full spectrum has kind of an awful taste to it, and the CBD isolate has no taste, so all you taste is the great ingredients that we put in our product. Okay, I'd like to be so bold as to take a crack at redoing your 30-second pitch. Okay, no, you stay right there, because I'm probably going to mangle your story. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Angela. <clears throat> <laughs> I will stop right there, right? I know, I, I got <laughs> to go stick my finger in an electric socket or something. <laughs> it doesn't look that bad. <laughs> we rehearsed this about an hour ago. <laughs> My company makes uh, cannabidiol products. Those are, as you know, the non-psychoactive component of marijuana. The medical benefits of that are very good for depression, for a fair amount of pain, and a number of athletes have declared that it speeds recovery from concussions. And so I, I am pursuing customers in those groups. What makes my product different and unique is we use an extract which is much better tasting than the competition. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. I'm not really Angela. Okay. Thank you. Nice job. Who else? Hi. My name is Joe. I'm one of the co-founders of BizDev IQ, and we have a marketplace that provides uh, digital transformation domain experts to small business owners to meet in person and prepare them for the future digital economy. So our experts meet the business owners to help them adopt, to help them accelerate the business adoption of emerging technologies in New York City. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. All right, some feedback, please. Yes, ma'am. The question the was who owners. pays you? And the answer? The business owners. Okay. Why is it important? I'm going to repeat the question for the video. Why is it important for business owners to buy your product? I'll stop there. Because small business owners don't have the in-house expertise to adopt AI, machine learning, and other emerging technologies. So they can they need to hire consultants uh, in person, not virtual consulting. All right. I have a question for the group. Joe, stand by a second. Are you guys familiar with the journalistic expression "burying the lead"? What's it mean? What's it mean? Yes, no, above you. Yes, the bashful one. Young, handsome, Catholic, John F. Kennedy was assassinated today. I submit you buried the lead. Business owners have been hearing about AI and machine learning as ways to accelerate their progress into the 21st century realities of business today, and they don't have the expertise to do it themselves. They're running around with their trousers on fire, trying to keep the business together, and do not have the time nor the resources to understand this esoteric endeavor. And we have a team of experts who will understand their business, who have deep domain expertise in this technology. We can make it easy for them, and they'll make more money. Okay. One more. There's a little bit of a rhythm to this. And, and, and by the way, on Tuesday of next week, we're going to dive into this rather deeply on how you present your venture. So if you're still breathing by that point, do come back. We're going to dive into this. But let's take one more, and then I'll bring it on. Come on. Come on down. 30 seconds is a whole lot harder than you think it is. Most entrepreneurs I know can do a wonderful job in 30 minutes and butcher it in 30 seconds. No pressure. <laughs> I'll try. Uh, hi, I'm Jamie. 
we have a solution for home, home monitoring system for pediatric oncology patients so that they can monitor their condition continuously, uh, prevent side effects and complications during chemotherapy. We also coupled it with a one-stop solution, uh, one-stop educational tool so that patients know uh, what to do with their condition because currently uh, the practice is patients are sent home being assumed knowing exactly how to take care of themselves by physicians, but they don't, causing a lot of uh, uh, complications, high medical cost, and a potential uh, less satisfied patient outcome. Thank you. Okay, some feedback? Right, uh, that's a quick question. Are you so Let me so repeat it. The question was, who's your customer? You didn't tell us who's gonna pay you for it. So actually, it's separated. All users or customer users are patients and families, but the, the customs, paying customs, actually will be health plans and insurance companies. Somebody else? All right, let me take a quick crack at this. I'm actually going to get you guys out of here in five minutes on time. Um, and let me say, as a sidebar, for those of you who are in healthcare ventures, you really have more of a customer complex than a customer per se. You're going to find yourself in situations where the doc says, I want it. The nursing staff says, I want it. The purchasing group in the hospital says, who are you? Whole different drill. Right. So in fairness, what you have is a tough 30 second sell. So forgive me, I will probably screw this up. but. There are a few things harder to imagine than your child having cancer. And when your child, God forbid, has cancer, they need monitoring constantly. And in-home monitoring systems currently are very insufficient. There's two consequences for this. One, constant anxiety for the parents, and two, a failure of health care to provide optimal care, which results in greater expenses for the hospital. We have a home monitoring system that's better than anything else out there. The parents love it, the patients get better care, and the hospital's bills get reduced. Thank you. You're welcome. You see where I'm going here? Customers. I'm not completely monomaniacal, by the way. We do talk about other stuff in the, in the course of this, but tonight's talk is customers. So, final questions? Who's going to be my first customer? What evidence do I have that they were willing to pay for my product? Where will they buy it? That was your, your pal's question there, right? Who's responsible for sales? It takes a particularly deviant personality to enjoy sales. You need one of these lunatics on your staff. Okay, any final questions? Okay, then let me summarize. If you wanna have a successful business, there's only one non-negotiable requirement. You have to have customers. And that means you have to be able to provide something that's important and unique to someone specifically. So figure out who really wants what you've got, find them, tell them about it, and take their money. Thank you very much.